every side effect you get from Trembolone is, is dose related. And most people can alleviate that by just taking a small dose. Like I said, 50 milligrams three times a week is plenty. You're going to get all the benefits and you're not going to get the side effects of it. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Television, rsmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Anything and everything, bodybuilding and non bodybuilding, is on the table. Diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros contest, of course, this past weekend, an exciting IFBB Texas pro. We are in the thick of the IFBB contest calendar. And of course, the Olympia, hard to believe, only about 11 weeks away. So a lot's going to happen between now and then. So the next 30 minutes, your forum, whatever you want to ask Dave Palumbo. We're going to go right into our questions. The first two questions, of course, on this show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, first question is about PED-induced chronic hiccups. hiccups. Uh, keep in mind, I am an IFBB Pro bodybuilder, 150 mg test E, 50 mg test P, 100 mg trend a 100 mg mass p when i increase the above protocol to every day i start with i have non-stop chronic hiccups after about seven to ten days your thoughts ps of the show best 30 bucks a fitness enthusiast or competitor can spend yeah you know a lot of people have been telling me how much they really enjoy the day palumbo experience app and you know a lot of people didn't really know what it was and then a couple of people joined and then they told their friends you know, it's it's getting all my videos, all my writings in one place, and so it's it's really uh, excellent access to a lot of knowledge. And we constantly are increasing that that knowledge base or that library of information because every video I do on regular YouTube gets put on there, and then I do a Q and A video just for the app members every single week. I answer everyone's questions on the app in an open forum so everyone can see the questions and the answers, which is a good learning experience. And then, of course, all my protocols, diets off-season pre-contest, my drug cycles are on there, and you get a workout every single week put up there. So it's a great value to $29, and you download it at your Android or iTunes store. Now, to get to the question about hiccups, this really kind of got on my radar probably about 10 years ago. A couple bodybuilders had asked me about the fact that they had chronic hiccups, and they couldn't figure out why. And um, I said, you know, I went through the litany of all the possible you know, you know, indigestion, because sometimes if you get acid reflux, that can cause. Um, but I'm thinking to myself, why all of a sudden did this person start getting acid reflux? And I kind of narrowed it down to Trenbolone. In some people, Trenbolone, and it's a dose-related thing. See, a lot of people didn't have this hiccup thing going on back in the day, because we used a long-acting Trenbolone known as um, Parabolin. And people, the dosages they used really weren't that high. But when you start getting into higher doses of trend acetate, which is very fast acting, it seems to, to irritate. Sometimes it causes acid reflux, which can cause the hiccups, but sometimes it just overstimulates the diaphragm muscle and that, uh, and that nerve, that, that phrenic nerve that innervates it. And it makes it not contract in, in sequence properly. And so you get that, you know, you get that what we call hiccuping, it's really just your diaphragm that's spontaneously contracting out of, out of sequence. And it is a dose related thing. And that's why this, it's a good question because that's why this person noticed when they went from every other day to every day, they over exceeded the threshold, at least in their body, uh, that, that was uh, viable. So obviously the correct answer to the question would be cut it back to every other day. Um, there's no reason 
I actually reduced the amount of Tremblon that I recommend that people use. Cause I only used, I used to use 50 milligrams three times a week, like every other day type of thing. And it worked great. And yeah, sometimes I would go to like maybe every day, the last week of a show, but I found that the, the people don't look better on more. They just get more side effects, meaning they can't sleep. They get the hiccups. Sometimes they get indigestion. A lot of people it makes them poop too a lot. It gives them diarrhea because it overstimulates the digestive tract. It uh, it hypes the body. Androgens in general do that. Aggression also is is a problem. And if you raise your pro excuse me, if you raise your um, your androgen level too much, especially using Tremblone, you can have high prolactin levels, which can cause erection issues. So. Every side effect you get from Trembolone is, is dose related. And most people can alleviate that by just taking a small dose. Like I said, 50 milligrams three times a week is plenty. You're going to get all the benefits and you're not going to get the side effects of it. Second question again, these questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Um, good one here because this is another uh, topic of conversation we have had uh, over and over again. And that is regarding cardio, different types of cardio, and if too much cardio uh, could have negative effects on your gains. And this one specific um, to Stairmaster, can excessive amounts of Stairmaster shrink your leg size? I mean, what does logic tell you? Obviously, if you overdo high intensity cardio, which is pretty much what the Stairmaster is, it's very, you know, even if you're going at a low pace, you're stepping up and, you, and it's causing you to have to work those legs overworking them every single day is, is not going to be good for muscle gains and or maintain uh, maintenance of muscle mass. So yes, you can lose muscle mass. Not everyone will. Some people just have good recovery and they can, they can deal with a lot of stress, but I don't like doing the stepper um, for, especially for men, especially for men whose legs are maybe not their best body part. It just seems to overtrain the legs and in people like myself who have a very fast metabolism, it can cause a, a catabolism or breakdown of muscle mass in those uh, leg fibers. So my suggestion is to do no hill climbing, no stepping, just walk on the treadmill, use your elliptical, the recumbent bike or the stationary bike. Those are, those are going to make you move and spin and or pedal or whatever you, you know, you call the elliptical that you do without having a lot of tension on your legs because you don't want to overstress those muscles. That's why people always ask me, hey, how can you have me do cardio on leg day? I said, well, because when you're doing cardio, you shouldn't be feeling any tension on your legs. Uh, when I was getting into cycling, you know, for a while, I thought that when you went out to cycle, you had to have it on a very high speed. Like they have, you know, they have these like, I don't know, they're like 30 speeds now, these bikes. And because you wanted to have hard tension when, you, when you're pedaling, because I figured you would be able to pedal, go further on, on, on less of a crank on the shaft. But the truth is that the, the best cyclists out there have no tension on their legs and they're just spinning very fast. It's the heart that's allowing them to spin fast, but there's no tension on your legs. If you have tension on your legs as a cyclist, you're going to just, your, your legs are going to get tons of lactic acid build up and, and you're not going to be able to, you know, to, to pedal after a while. Same thing with bodybuilding. You don't want to have a tremendous amount of tension when you're doing your cardio or you're going to break down too much muscle in your legs. And that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to just get the heart moving a little bit so we burn some fat. And so be very careful of, of overdoing the stepper. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us on Instagram, the handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time here on our YouTube channel, we welcome you. We ask that you subscribe below, hit the notification bell so you're not going to miss any of our show segments, updates, of course, right now being in the thick of the IFBB contest schedule. So any of our preview segments, breakdown segments right now, we have on the channel uh, our uh, wrap-up segments from the Texas Pro. We had Pre-judging wrap-ups, final wrap-ups, and then, of course, Dave Palumbo and Chris Aceto with their full uh, comprehensive breakdown of the Texas Pro on Heavy Muscle Radio. And then, of course, all-new episode of our After Hours yesterday featuring Dave, John Romano, and the Whack Pack. So speaking of the Texas Pro, Dave, I don't know if you saw this video yet, but um, and it received a lot of praise, a lot of positive uh, feedback from the bodybuilding community. Uh, Tyler Mannion, who was the head judge of the Texas Pro, he put up... Uh, explainer videos on his Instagram page uh, right. talking about the judging criteria for the open for the 212. So specific to that, uh, the question is from M. Sutta. He talks specifically about how the judges don't like when guys hit the side tricep pose and kind of turn and face forward 
Now, Andrew Jack did that at the Texas Pro on every side try comparison. Uh, but for one, shouldn't he have gotten marked down for that? I'm glad that Tyler said that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I also hate that. Okay? Every, and every guy now hits their side tricep like that. And these are guys that shouldn't even be hitting it. It's, it's a really a pose for guys who have a very aesthetic, teeny waist. And what they do is they hit the side try, and then at the very last minute, they kind of like cheat it around, and they give you – they're basically hitting an ab shot, you know, for you because they have such beautiful abs. I see guys with blocky waist doing it. I don't even know why. They just think, well, if this guy does it, I should do it. It's not meant for that. And you shouldn't be hitting that shot. It's a side try, I suppose, like Tyler says – you want to keep your leg turned to the side because that's where you see that big hamstring drop and the big billowy front quad and you can see your glute. I'm telling you, people kill that pose and I don't know why. And you know what the funny thing is? Sean Roden was a master at that pose. When he, but he had one of the best side triceps in the business. He hit the real side tricep and then at the very last minute he would just turn and, and hit, the, hit it from the front because he had a very tiny waist with a good taper and, and a great front quad. But not everyone's supposed to hit that. And, and I'm glad that Tyler is saying that this is going to be marked down because people are just only hitting it from the front. And it's not a front pose. It's a side pose. So good job, Tyler. And I hope they, they start to – you know what they used to do? You can't really mark people down for it because, you know, what are you going to say? He lost the show because he, he turned his, his body to the front on the side. So what they should do is – and I, I've seen Weinberger do this, and I've seen the other judges do it when Jim Raquel was there – the judges yell at the, at the bodybuilders up on stage, <laughs> don't turn to the front. It's a side pose. And that's so embarrassing when you're on stage that, you, believe me, everyone stops doing it. <laughs> so I think the judges should just – the head judge should reinforce it while he's judging and yell at them. I've seen the judges say spread out to the guys. They've seen the judges say you're crowding each other, move back. You know, I, So the, judge, the head judge's job is just not to call poses. It's to also instruct the guys what he doesn't like or she doesn't like that they're seeing on stage. And a good head judge will, will control that, that panel well. Uh, sometimes, you know, they let these guys get away with too much. And uh, um, it's like when a guy you – know, you ever see when these guys start stepping forward on each other to hit a pose, and then it'll, the other one will move up. And before they know it, they're almost off the front of the stage <laughs> because the, everyone wants to get one step up on each other. And the judges – the good head judge says, get back behind the line. And they, they keep order in there. And that's what – we need to see. We need to see the head judges, and that's probably why Tyler said that. In the future, the head judges have to tell these guys, I don't want to see you from the front. Turn to the side. It's a side pose. And believe me, it's embarrassing to hear yourself getting yelled at by the judges, and they won't do it anymore. Another uh, topic of conversation that we have had often on this show and um, one that you do get asked about specifically, and that is backstage pump-up, but more in particular, backup, uh, backstage pump-up foods. Rachel Pomeros, know your best backstage pump up foods. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's a tough situation to make a, a call on this, but I'm going to tell you why my what my reasoning is for what I do. I tell my guys, you know, or girls, to have I have meals, and then usually when we get to about an hour or an hour and a half before they're getting on stage, I'll go to rice cakes and peanut butter. So they'll they'll, they'll have like these all natural, you know, lightly salted no sugar on these um, on these rice cakes, and they'll put like a tablespoon of all-natural peanut butter, like Smucker's, that doesn't have sugar in it, and just eat those, you know, like every, you know, 30 minutes or so, have one or two of those. And what that does is it keeps your blood sugar stable. Fats delay the absorption of carbs. Rice cakes are very fast-acting carbs, so they kind of just allows the, the carbs to slowly trickle into the bloodstream. They don't occupy a lot of space in, in, your, in your stomach because the rice cakes are basically all air. And that seems to work really well backstage. Now, you, I, I have seen, and uh, you know, guys backstage drinking alcohol, sugary drinks or sugary fruits and or or candy bars. Here's the thing: you can do you do a candy bar backstage with a with a you know a shot of wine or alcohol. You look good for about 10, 15 minutes. You might get some veins going if you if you know because the sugar you get a sugar rush and you get a little the the, the alcohol can dilate the veins. But if you're waiting around for a long period of time or you go out on stage and that prejudging is lasting 20, 30 minutes because it's a close show, you know what happens in the middle? Your blood sugar crashes because sugars spike insulin. Insulin drives the blood sugar down. 
And a lot of times when you eat simple sugars, your body releases too much insulin and it lowers it. It's like you ever, you ever go to like lunch when you're a kid in school, you eat a lot of junk food and then you, you go into class and you fall asleep because your blood sugar gets so low. It's not worth it because if your blood sugar drops on stage, what's going to happen is you're going to start sweating. You're going to get a cold sweat and the sweat's going to start running down your body. You've seen this happen to guys on stage and you're going to start feeling like you're out of it, like you're just not connected anymore to your body. And that's typical low blood sugar. You do not want that happening on stage. It's not worth it. Now, if you went out and the, and the pre-judging was five minutes because you blew everyone away, you might pull it off. But more than likely, you're going to screw it up, and it's going to screw up how you look. You need to go out there thinking, hey, I'm going to be out here for an hour. I need a sustained energy source. I don't need to, to do anything that's going to make my body look good for five minutes and then make it look terrible after that. Go conservatively. You've dieted for 16 weeks. You did all your homework ostensibly you look your best, go out there and don't do anything kooky backstage. Because once you do that, you're asking for trouble because there's unknown variables. It might work once out of every 20 times. I don't like those odds. Those odds are not good odds to me. One in 20 is not is not what I want. I want 100% of the time it's going to work and 100% of the time I get the same results. That's Those are good results. We were talking about yesterday's episode of After Hours, um, Met and Bean, you mentioned a uh, cereal to Larry Pollock yesterday, something about something being uh, Crohn's disease friendly. Do you remember the name of that cereal? It's some keto cereal. I, I think I bought it on Amazon.com. I always try different keto cereals and stuff like that. And um, I, don't, I don't remember which one he was talking about. Um, I Because what happens is I try it and then, I, and then I'm, I'm like, I don't want to do it anymore. I stopped doing it. It's not something that I um, – I have used something called the cerealschool.com. They have a pretty good um, uh, keto cereal. Th theirs is probably the best macronutrient wise because they use like monk fruit. They don't use any artificial sweeteners. Um, they have no net. I don't think there's any net carbs in theirs. Um, it's not as sweet as some of the other ones that use like erythritol, but erythritol bothers some people's stomachs. So um, the cereal school was good. I mean, if you check their stuff out, uh, it's a little expensive. Uh, the they come in like little packs, like the little cereal packs, like that you used to use when you're a kid. Uh, there are other cereals. There's some in the supermarkets, you know, you can try out as well. But you got to watch out for hidden stuff they put in some of these things. And uh, I think I had one I was using. My wife noticed that she read something online that was like, it was like deep fried or something like that. It was like the way they processed the the um, the actual cereal itself was not, not necessarily the healthiest, um, I guess, way you can do it. And uh, there was a lot of corn oils in there and, and pro-inflammatory oil. So I was like, yeah, it is technically keto. But it might not be the healthiest to be eating it all day long. So, but that cereal school is, looks like the best one to me on paper. Um, beef liver. Your thoughts uh, about eating beef liver as a protein source? I don't. I don't like the whole idea of liver at all because, first of all, liver is not a better source of protein than 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 the beef or you know uh, aspect of the cow would be, right? Because that's. Skeletal muscle is, is a better, which is what, you know, like different cuts of meat, top round, filet mignon, uh, you know, top, you know, um, lo, lo, what is it called? Um, ribeye, all those other cuts have to be better in terms of protein content than liver. So it's not, you're not going to eat liver for the protein content. Ostensibly, you're, you're eating liver maybe for the fatty acid content. I don't know. Not that it has a lot of fatty acids in it or possibly the vitamin content that it has in there. Um, but you got to also remember that the liver is the detoxification organ for these animals. And so you're eating toxins too in there. That's where they're stored. Heavy metals, you know, the toxins from the ground that these, these animals are eating grass that are in the ground. So I, I just don't think that liver is very healthy for you. And I don't think it has any benefits that you can't get from vitamins and from other sources of protein, like, you know, lean meats and stuff like that. So I don't really, I don't really get it. I mean, back in the day, guys would take desiccated liver tablets, where basically the liver tablets with the fatty acids, the fat content removed. And I don't know what what people thought they did. Maybe it was extra protein because they, there was no like whey proteins back then, and maybe maybe it was a good source. But today, I, I just don't understand what liver would possibly do for you, unless you're the liver king and you're eating it raw just for uh, marketing purposes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm not a big fan of eating organ meats. I don't think that they offer any kind of advanced nutrition that we're not getting from our other foods. 
Let's go to Leon James Fit. I'm going to have a CT scan done soon. Ideally, the score we want to see is zero. My question is, what percentage would be a concern in your opinion? Say my scan is a 20% blockage. Should I get back on statin since I have genetically high cholesterol? I follow all your suggestions from diet to your supplements, but my cholesterol will not lower. So I'm very anxious to see what this scan shows. Yeah. He didn't really indicate whether he's getting a CT calcium score, which is the... the uh, the quicker of the tests, or if he's getting a CT angiogram with with contrast, which is what I usually recommend because you, you can you can visualize the, the vessels more. If he has a, if you have a twenty percent blockage in in a vessel, you know that's not necessarily a great thing. You know I found that something that I didn't. I had all my CT scans, my calcium score, my CT angiogram, and I've got a lot of them over the years. It says I have nothing in them. And when I got a, a cardiac catheterization done, when I had before I had my um, my aorta surgery, they, they make you get one of those. I don't know why. I had a 30% um, in one vessel. I had a 30% soft plaque in there that, that was in there. I don't even know why. It, it, it was because it was soft and it wasn't calcified. They couldn't see it on a scan. Um, I, don't even, I don't even remember what vessel it was in. So, you know, one little, you know, blockage like that is probably not a big deal. If you have them all over. Or if you have a lot of cal- – if he's getting a calcium score and his calcium score is pretty high, like over like 100, um, you know, you might want to start doing things to combat the possibility of having block – you know, of, of having future problems. Uh, you could take a pure EPA oil, which oh, there's a company called Omega Via on Amazon.com. You can buy it from them. I use that stuff. It's um, in addition to Omega Lies, which is what we make from Species Nutrition, which is a balance of fish oil and omega-6 uh, oils. We I take extra EP, just EPA, because they show that EPA oil at 2,000 milligrams per day can help clear out plaques if you have plaque formation in there. Obviously, taking your vitamin D3 and your K2, K2 can help direct calcium away from the blood vessels um, and into the bones. So that's a good thing. You might want to add uh, vitamin K2. I know Life Extension makes a, a K2, D3 combination you can get. So you can do it all in one shot. Uh, trying to think what else uh, you want to do. Uh, obviously, taking um, a good quality soluble fiber supplement like Fiberlyze will help reduce LDL cholesterol as well as Omega Lyze will do that as well. So if you kind of take a multi-tiered approach to your nutrition and your diet, you should be able to keep, you know, plaque formation to a minimum. Now, the problem is when you have a genetic predisposition for this, a lot of times there's nothing you can do about it. And it just seems to happen in those cases. Those are the really the only cases that I recommend that people take like a, uh, one of these like Crestors or these, um, you know, statin drugs that can help lower LDL cholesterol because you're basically battling bad genetics. You're not battling anything that you're doing wrong. It's just happening because of what your genetic code is telling your body to do. So in those cases, that probably would be an instance where I would consider using a statin. Let's go to the grind box too. Uh, Dave, you mentioned coming out with an electrolyte powder. If the RDA is 4,700 of potassium per day, why do all the electrolyte powders except for he mentions Dr. Berg's have less than 500 mg per serving of potassium. Salt is easy to add, so why dose so high with salt? Well, so usually sodium is what we lose the most when we sweat. Because remember, the, the potassium is inside your cells. So it's very hard to lose potassium. Matter of fact, the only way they say that you really can lose excessive amounts of potassium is by throwing up. So if you get sick or have a stomach virus and you're throwing up a lot, that could lower your potassium level. Um, usually through just sweating and exercise, you don't lose potassium, you lose sodium. That's why most of the electrolyte drinks are higher in sodium than they are in potassium. Also, you don't want to give too much potassium because potassium can cause uh, arrhythmias in your body. So if you have too much in the bloodstream in, in relation to, to, to uh, sodium, you can actually you know, cause your heart to start fluttering and stuff like that because potassium is supposed to be inside the cell. So you, once again, because you don't lose it very easily, uh, you don't need to put it back as vigorously as you put back sodium. So using less potassium over you know, a daily basis is the way to go as opposed to huge massive amounts in, in one drink, which can cause problems. So that's why they don't do that. Um, our electrolyte drink, we're right now we're, we're flavor sampling it because we're not going to be using any artificial sweeteners in them. So we're going to be using like monk fruit 
and some stevia to flavor it. And uh, so far, it tastes pretty damn good. i got to be honest with you. And it's going to be carb-free. So for people who are dieting, they can still use the electrolyte drink. A lot of people say, well, you know, you should really use like some uh, some mild sugars or some, you know, like Gatorade. You, Gatorade is, 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 is idiotic because – in their in their regular Gatorade drink, they use high fructose corn syrup, which I have no idea why. It's the worst source of sugar. It's like poison. Their Gatorade Zeros are pretty good because they don't have any of that in there. There's no sugar. Um, that new drink, Prime, that Logan Paul puts out, has got some coconut um, water in there. Um, and in the and in the packets, he's got the there. It's it's um, coconut powder. So, but it's still that's still sugar. So for people who are like bodybuilders who are dieting, they're not going to use that. Because that's a waste of, of calories, you know, waste of carbs, especially. So I think that an electrolyte drink with no carbs that, or no direct carb sources that can be absorbed, I think, is a way to go. Um, Alexander Ruin, coach. I know you always say every two to three months you should take a week off. Should you plan those ahead or take them when you feel like taking a break? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would do it when you if you feel up to it, or if, let's say you're going to go on vacation or something like that. I, you know, I, I very rarely take an entire week off. I kind of just let um, life happen. So if life happens where we have a hurricane here or something like that, or my kids are all home sick or something like that, I can't get out of the house, then I take off a couple extra days. Um, while everything is going well, if I feel good and I have a lot of energy and I'm not like, I don't feel like I'm overtrained, which I really don't because I, I never train more than four or five days a week, um, I, go, I go to the gym on my, on my regular schedule. It's only when I feel really run down that I'll take a few days off. So, it, you know, some people may only do it once a year, take a week off. Some people never take a week off. Some people may, may take four or five days off in a row, and that might be enough of them. Go by what your body dictates. If you're not a chronic overtrainer, you probably don't need huge, huge layoffs. But a lot of times after a show, it's nice to get a couple extra days off and uh, to recover. The problem is we, we, we bodybuilders use our training as almost like therapy for us. So we get that endorphin rush. We feel good. It, it's like it's like therapeutic. So, in a sense, a lot of guys like to just go because they feel better after they train. You know, so if you can't make it a week, do four days. Four days is better than one day. You know, so go by go by instinct. I, I'm a big instinctual trainer. Speaking of training, seemingly one of the I guess favorite topics on this show has been to ask you about uh, the debate between training once a week, two to three times a week, so on and so forth, and. I can kind of predict what your answer is going to be on this sure. one. But again, this guy asks a lot of good questions. So I wanted to give him the opportunity it's from uh, Nico Cantemir. So uh, he wants to know, I guess, the science behind not training muscle two to three times a week, assuming you eat well, you rest. Why not train them more? I know on many occasions you've talked about, well, look, if you train the muscle hard enough, you shouldn't want to uh, train it again, you know, during the course of that week. But I guess if you can give maybe more of a background scientific, yeah. um, you know, justification as far as why once a week versus two to three times a week. It, it's very simple. Your body just can't recover. I mean, if you're going, look, if you're going to the gym and, you, and you're training like six sets, not that heavy, you know, you're doing like a, a circuit workout. Yeah. You could probably train each body part three times a week like that because you're really not doing anything. You're kind of like almost doing an aerobic workout with your upper body or lower body. The problem is when you get into the gym and you start getting bigger, more muscular, you're able to activate more fibers and lift heavier weights, you're really, really damaging the, the muscle fibers tremendously. And it, it doesn't take two days for those to heal. It might take you know five or six days before those, those big fibers heal up. So if you're going back to the gym and training that body part again, when you haven't even repaired yourself from the, the, the first workout, what do you think is going to happen? You think you're going to grow? No, you're, you're over breaking down the muscle and it's never having a chance to rebuild itself. So you're never going to put size on you. You might even lose size because your body might actually, you might be breaking down too much muscle. You know, you see guys go to the, the doctors and they get blood work and their, and their CPK levels are like 10,000. And that's on one body part per, per, per week. Imagine if you trained each body part twice or three times a week, what your CPK levels, which would be, which is basically a, 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 an assessment of muscle damage. Um, because those enzymes are usually found inside the muscle. When you break down, you know, fibers, it leaks those enzymes into the bloodstream. So we know that that five day a week, at least training, raises those enzyme levels through the roof. If you did it more than that, it would be absolutely crazy. That's why only really genetically gifted people can recover. 
And I still believe Ronnie used to train each body part twice a week. I think if he would have trained him once a week, he would have been better. I think he would have been even bigger. Um, Menser, you know, I was talking to my, this guy I trained in the gym today about Menser. Mike Menser pretty much had his workouts down to about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. And a lot of that was warm up. And he only did a couple of sets, but they would do these super hyper intense, you know, high intensity, you know, uh, sets that they would do. And, you know, his, his idea was like, yes, less volume is good, but let's, I don't even, I don't believe in less volume. I believe in like only doing like two, three exercises, period, you know? And I believe that really the reason why he was so popular back in the nineties doing these workouts is because people who were hiring him as their coach and, and were going to Golds and Venice and training with him were professionals. They were doctors and lawyers and people who, businessmen who had, they didn't have three hours a day to train. They liked the whole idea that, hey, I could put muscle on in training 20 minutes a day. I could slip that into my day on my lunch hour. And that's what made that so popular. It was an extreme, it was an extreme position he took. And I think it was a little too extreme because I don't think many people can activate enough muscle fibers in such so few sets to actually get good results. Dorian can do it because Dorian was huge and he was able to feel those muscles contract so severely. He was able to put so much effort into those couple of sets that he would do that he actually got benefits out of but most people that I knew who did that type of a one set, maybe two exercises workout, you know, three, two, two times or three times a week were not really getting bigger. They weren't, it wasn't like they were losing size, but they weren't getting bigger or better. The quality wasn't there. So I kind of took that approach and took, hey, you know, this is, this is, if we normally train 15 sets, maybe I can get it done in, in eight or nine sets and, and, and recover better. And I, and that's what I found worked for me. So I was doing a modified version of what Menser suggested. Hey, stop all that volume, only do it once a week, um, get more rest days. But I was able to do enough to actually activate what I was trying to do. And, 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 and that's where it comes from. But I think really the Menser, philosophy was because he wanted to make money. He was, he was down on his luck. He had no cash. He, he was Mr. High Intensity, and he made it marketable for people who didn't have the time to be in the gym for three hours a day. I wanted to save this one to last. Um, it's from Ivan Benny, and that's, uh, so he asks if you were aware. I mean, I know you're aware. Uh, Milos told you about this, about uh, Nasser taking 500 mg and a draw a day. Um, I guess he's referencing a conversation that Milos had on the Jay Cutler podcast. Milos uh, showcased from his logbook. Uh, Jay said he was taking 200 mg, crazy high doses. Your thoughts on, I guess, it, uh, on the, the high dose of Anadrol. How often is this among bodybuilders? I, I would say in the 90s yeah. versus today. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone does that much Anadrol. And I'll tell you why, because... I was a 300 plus pound bodybuilder, right? And I couldn't get through, I couldn't take 50 milligrams a day and, and get through more than a week on the stuff because I couldn't eat. I had no appetite. I would get these sticking pains in my like side where my liver is. I don't know if it was actually liver pain or not, but everyone, I, I know a lot of people tell me they get the same pains and I just felt crappy on it. My eyes were like all swollen. It, it did make me a little stronger than I was not much stronger, but it, that made me a little stronger, but you know, I felt, I said, you know what? Injectables do everything this stuff does and you don't feel terrible and you, and it, and you can eat. So if I can't eat, I can't grow. So, um, while Jay Cutler and Nasser might've been genetic freaks that whose bodies can handle that kind of a dosage. Um, number one, I don't recommend it because it is liver, very liver toxic. And so you don't want to be taking that high a dosage for any length of time. Number one. And number two, if it works so well, more people today would be doing it. But like I said, anyone who starts taking Anadrol, especially at that dose, will find that they cannot eat food. You know, the only person I knew who took a lot of Anadrols was, was Jimmy Pelleccia personally. And Jimmy ate hot dogs all day. And he, he hardly ate anything. He was not a big eater because he wasn't trying to, like, put on, you know, 50 pounds of muscle. He was just trying to get stronger in the gym. So you can't even use him as a good example. How Nasser ate food, I have no idea. But he had a weird appetite, too. He didn't like many things. So I, I wonder if it was because he was on a lot of orals. Um, and I'm sure when Jay would do the four anadrols a day, I'm sure he didn't do it for any you know, length of period of time. He probably did it for like three, four weeks at a time. Uh, but I don't, I don't recommend it, once again, because of the toxicity level. And because the injectables do everything that the orals do, there's no reason to subject your body to that kind of stress or any kind of – you know, when they when you hear that – steroids can cause liver cancer and liver you know, abscesses and, and um, I mean, liver um, uh, cysts 
uh, that grow in there, those blood-filled cysts. It's all because of that. That's what Anadrol does. The problem is that what they do is they take the side effects of one drug, the worst side effects of all the drugs, and they put them on a pamphlet on all the drugs. So they make it look like, well, Anavar can cause that, and testosterone can cause that. It's not true. It's it's the orals, the the, the 17 alpha alkylated, really, you know, heavy duty orals like you know, uh, Anadrol and Dianabol that can cause those those problems if you take them for long periods of time. So my suggestion is stay away from them. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, if you haven't already done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. Right now on the channel, all new episode of After Hours. Uh, Dave actually just did a rant about diet soda and whether or not it will kill you. So that's live on the channel right now. And of course, all new episode of Heavy Muscle Radio, Dave Palumbo, Chris Cicero, and of course, all of our content from this past weekend's Texas Pro. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.